so friends uh, welcome to this yet another session of uh, uh, our webinars sunday critical care webinars and uh, this is our 40th webinar today's topic is neuromuscular diseases in the icu and it will be taken by dr chandrashish who is from apollo calcutta is a senior consultant there and uh, he is, uh, you know, he's done his MD in anesthesia from AIMS, and uh, he has a unique distinction of, I think, doing two MRCPs, which is quite unique. Uh, one in general medicine and one is respiratory medicine, and uh, he'll be definitely covering myasthenia gravis and critical illness neuropathy and Gullian uh, 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 Barre, which are the common things we see, and of course there'll be other differentials. And uh, we are joined uh, by, by the eminent neurologist from AIMS, uh, Professor Bhatia, Rohit Bhatia. And sir will be giving the neurology inputs. Uh, and if you have any questions pertaining to that, you are welcome. We'll try to make the session interactive. Uh, Dr. Chandrashish has taken up some actual cases. And uh, let's see how it goes. Hope you will uh, find it useful. So without further ado, I hand it over to Dr. Chandrashish, sir, to start the proceeding. Dr. Chandrashish, please take over. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I will be, uh, uh, give me a moment to just share my screen so that, uh, yeah. So is my screen visible now to everybody? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I'm privileged to talk on a topic which is not uh, very common, but we often face it in uh, in ICUs, and we obviously manage it with uh, neurologists. And uh, we are extremely privileged to have Dr. Bhatia with us today, who is going to guide us on uh, the neuro neurological nuances of this particular problem. Now, um, we will start with a case. And then we'll try to move um, in the direction of discussions uh, regarding how to approach such problems uh, in the ICU. And then let us see how the discussion goes and uh, we will progress in that way. So uh, without uh, further delay, I want to start with the case. This is, a, uh, this is about a 70 year old female who gets transferred from another uh, hospital in the same city where I uh, work, that is the city of Calcutta. Um, she was transferred to the emergency on a ventilator and she was ventilated for more than 15 days in another hospital and the family decided to transfer to my hospital because there was a failure to wean the patient off the ventilator. She was treated there for initially admitted for some sort of a respiratory failure, uh, secondary to pneumonia, uh, gets on to the ventilator, but uh, and she was also tracheostomized. The discharge uh, paper writes that there was a suspicion of aspiration pneumonia, and she's also a known patient of uh, asthma. Uh, probably at this age, she is a what we call an ACOS or asthma COPD overlap syndrome. Uh, she has received various antibiotics in the previous hospital, which included uh, meropenem, clindamycin. Probably clindamycin was given thinking about aspiration. And um, there's a report of uh, a multi drug resistant Klebsiella. Which, is, which was growing in the tracheostomy tube culture report from the outside hospital. And they had given just the first dose of, uh, first uh, bolus dose of colistin before this patient gets transferred here. Um, historically, uh, this lady is on irregular inhalers at home. Uh, this lady does not live in the city of Calcutta, but she stays in another uh, city which is in the suburbs of Calcutta, a couple of hours uh, by road. Uh, 
and um, she does not have much of uh, uh, contact with any particular physician under whom she is being followed regularly for her asthma problems. But on and off, she uh, has been taking some oral steroids because she feels better whenever uh, she has any uh, episode of asthma exacerbation on taking the steroid tablets. There are no other cardiac, renal or liver problems that were apparent at this point in time. Um, and she was, uh, except for her asthma medications, which are kind of irregular, uh, un, uh, there was nothing else she was taking at home before admission to this hospital. On examination, she was responding to commands, but she sleeps off easily, which is kind of understandable. She has got a prolonged hospital stay. She was on ventilator uh, for a long time and obviously looks tired. There was significant weakness of all four limbs. Uh, upper limb power was around three by four, uh, lower limbs around two by four. Sensory could not be tested at this time. And uh, the usual diagnosis at this point for this kind of weakness in a patient who is coming from outside hospital is an ICU acquired weakness. And that is what it was suspected. On examination, there was a bilateral wheeze uh, on auscultation and there was uh, obstructive airflow patterns which could be seen on the ventilator graphics, particularly on the flow volume loops and also in the uh, flow time scalars, which are things which uh, intensivists usually take help of um, in diagnosing uh, various kinds of uh, obstructive airflow patterns. At this point, she was ordered the following tests. Obviously, it's a COVID time, so gets a COVID RT-PCR. Uh, this was negative in the previous hospital, though, but again, it was done before admission. Um, we did a complete blood counts, renal functions, liver function, electrolytes, fresh cultures were sent, uh, blood and urine. And uh, because there is still, uh, in spite of standard treatment for wheeze, there was still um, uh, significant uh, bronchospasm that was audible. Uh, both on auscultation as well as on graph, graphics. So we decided to do a CT scan and in the process also look at the pulmonary angiogram to see if there's a pulmonary embolism. Because rarely pulmonary embolism can present with uh, bronchospasm, which, does, which just doesn't get better with standard treatment. Um, IV steroids were again restarted uh, and with more aggressive nebulization at this point. What happened after this? Uh, the total leukocyte count came back a little high, around 15,000. We don't know whether this was because of some infection or because of steroids that she was getting uh, um, for this um, you know, asthma uh, problems, uh, both in outside hospital as well as here. Um, the electrolytes, urea creatinine was more or less normal. Um, the potassium was a little low, which was replaced. Um, the wheeze got better, slightly better, and the CT chest didn't show much of a consolidation or pneumonia or any specific patterns which were kind of uh, uh, like uh, there was a little bit of central bronchiectasis on the CT chest, which is understandable in this kind of a lady who has been suffering from such um, asthma COPD overlap for a long time. Uh, but we thought that Klebsiella is probably a colonizer. We could not see much of a pneumonia. And we didn't really dare to put in a bronchoscope in such a lady who is already having so much of wheels because that could have precipitated more of a problem. And we stopped the cholestin at this point. Uh, interestingly, the CT pulmonary angiogram found a sex small segmental pulmonary embolism. And we increased the anticoagulant dose at this point. Uh, that is therapeutic anticoagulation was started, which previously uh, she was getting prophylactic, uh, which is standard for all ICU patients. Now, um, 
we also checked phosphates uh, and thyroid functions um, which were uh, okay and over the next 72 hours uh, patient remained on ventilator but the weaning failed due to poor spontaneous minute ventilation poor spontaneous effort she was not being able to generate good tidal volume and every time we put her on uh, weaning there was a blood pressure surge and uh, we just could not uh, wean her again uh, the limb weaknesses uh, almost remains the same it persisted we did an echo and anti pro bnp at this point because heart failure is one of the uh, very important causes of uh, weaning failure among uh, patients in the ICU, particularly whenever we find a BP surge, we suspect that there may be a pulmonary edema which is contributing to uh, weaning failure. But these were also not very contributory uh, to diagnosis. So now what? Uh, we all heard that God uh, lives uh, in a good history taking and we decided to we again call the family and uh, take history once more what went wrong so the family again uh, comes and meets us um, and says that the she developed some kind of a weakness one year back uh, some kind of a generalized weakness for which she was treated with steroids along with some other medications on opd basis uh, they stopped all that after a few months but continued the steroids on and off for her asthma and those prescriptions are at hometown, so they are not available. And this time they uh, they could not uh, actually relate that there can be a relationship between the problem that happened one year back and this one. And this time she developed fever with cough, uh, so probably a respiratory, lower respiratory tract illness. And she became so weak that she could not open her eyes or get out of bed. And it is at this point that she was therefore admitted to the hospital in an outside uh, 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 the other hospital where she had to be ventilated for a type 2 respiratory failure because they said that the carbon dioxide had gone up at this point. So uh, it now became a little easy for us. We said we took the help of the neurologist. They did a repetitive nerve stimulation, which again showed a decremental response. We did an anti acetylcholinesterase receptor antibody, which comes back positive. And uh, we figured out that this patient is probably in a myasthenic crisis. Um, and the neurologist decided to start IVIG on this patient. Now, from this point, let us uh, move on to approaching such problems of neuromuscular disease in the ICU. And when we uh, find... Uh, I'll just like to just add a couple of things. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, we have myasthenia, but uh, uh, other things would uh, would warrant consideration would be the use of steroids and a steroid myopathy and possible use of neuromuscular blockers uh, in the outside of the hospital. And did we have a CPK done at any time? And I would also be concerned about the use of cholestin, you know, as cholestin was started and, uh, uh, you know, the, you can have neuropathy. So just additional risk Absolutely. factors, complicating. Uh, and how the CPK? Yeah. Um, so uh, the CPK at this point, uh, what we did was not too high. It was something around 124 or something. Uh, uh, there can be obviously an overlap of multiple problems. Cholestin, uh, he she didn't receive uh, the full course, but just started. But yes, a cholestin can precipitate or worsen myasthenia. That is true. Um, electrolyte imbalances, they were not much, uh, but yes, after 15 days of ventilation, the most important thing that can be contributing to the myasthenia is also ICU acquired weakness. So they can always coexist and we cannot deny that. So those things are obviously there. Uh, so, steroid Dr. myopathy. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, so there be multiple factors uh, in this apart from myasthenia that would warrant consideration, sir. Absolutely, like, absolutely. Huh? So multiple causes are possible here as we approach this case. Yes, it's possible. Dr. So, Bhatia, sir, any uh, moving on. May I, may I just kind of make it, you know, a little bit. Dr. Bhatia, any comments, sir? Uh, 
Dr. Chandrasekhar is uh, elucidating on now the approach, and uh, whenever we see a patient who is developing a new onset weakness in the ICU, uh, then of course uh, there are many things which need to be placed in the context, and uh, sometimes you know we we tend to uh, to look at uh, many uh, different factors, which includes medications, uh, undiagnosed neuromuscular disorder, which is the kind of example which is glaring in such a situation where the history was finally brought in the concept that patient has an existing neuromuscular disease of course uh, consider spinal cord disease uh, critical illness related disease uh, and uh, loss of muscle mass for someone who's been in the icu for a long time electrolyte disorders uh, systemic illness and of course uh, you know uh, the use of steroids and neuromuscular blocking agents so I think uh, quite many factors have been uh, well elucidated in the description uh, in the case right now, and and I'm sure they will be uh, they will be well elucidated. So we, we can continue to discuss. I yeah. guess. Thank you, sir. Please carry on, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Sir. Yeah. So uh, whenever we find such uh, neuromuscular problems in the ICU, uh, we primarily can divide them into two groups one uh, where the patient may come to the icu with a neuromuscular disease uh, it may be a known neuromuscular disease or it is something that unveils in the icu because of uh, maybe the patient gets stuck on a ventilator or the patient undergoes a surgery and then just cannot be uh, brought out of anesthesia something like that or it can be a neuromuscular problem which develops in the ICU and of which the most important being the ICU acquired weakness and the critical illness neuromyopathy and neuropathy. Uh, so it's very important to understand the evolution of the weakness, the history and approach to, we approach to this weakness is also important. Uh, we all know that uh, once polio epidemic in Europe uh, this introduced mechanical ventilators to the field of medicine before the polio epidemic. Uh, although at that time it was negative pressure ventilators, but the polio epidemic showed that mechanical ventilators could save some lives. And uh, therefore the birth of critical care medicine in some way is related to neuromuscular diseases because without mechanical ventilation, probably the, critical care units wouldn't have started uh, uh, now, is, may I just, just so that is actually very well said or Chandrasekhar that the advent of mechanical ventilators positive pressure was with the polio epidemic I think it was in 1958 in Denmark and in fact the establishment of the first ICU was coincidental with the advent of this polio epidemic and mechanical ventilation that is very yes. remarkable actually that is very that is very interesting absolutely yes so now uh, we are really uh, not in that era. Polio has been eradicated from most parts of the world. And modern ICUs see more of other neuromuscular disorders like Guillain-Barré syndrome, myasthenia gravis, or ICU acquired weakness. These three, three being the big, uh, big three guns. And obviously, there are many more. Most common cause of neuromuscular weakness in modern ICU is uh, that we see is critical illness myopathy or critical illness polyneuropathy or a combination of both. And this is seen in more than 78% of patients. And if you look at the neuromuscular cause of weakness in the ICU, we can obviously divide them into four major headings, myopathies, peripheral neuropathies, neuromuscular junction disorders, and motor neuron diseases. And I have tried to kind of tick the important ones which are relevant and um, uh, most important for uh, intensive care physicians as well as students because somewhere down the line I think these uh, discussions will go down to the uh, students of intensive care who are giving their exams. So critical illness myopathy, rhabdomyolysis, uh, these are important causes of myopathy. Uh, also down the list in myopathy, hypophosphatemic myopathy is something as well as toxic myopathy are some uh, diseases which we see in the ICU. Hypophosphatemia, as you know, happens in the ICU quite commonly, particularly secondary to 
a phenomena called uh, you know uh, uh, because of uh, <coughs> eating uh, extra calories Re uh, um, refeeding syndrome, syndrome yeah yeah refeeding syndrome sorry thanks for reminding me and also toxic myopathies from various kinds of toxins drugs statins etc again peripheral neuropathies um, are critical illness polyneuropathies uh, gia barre syndrome and the rest uh, obviously are there in the list among neuromuscular junction disorders uh, prolonged neuromuscular blockade because of uh, the as uh, uh, dr tapesh also mentioned that uh, one of the reasons can be the use of neuromuscular blockers in the previous hospital in our uh, patient Uh, so prolonged neuromuscular blockades or infusion of neuromuscular blockers can cause uh, weakness myasthenia uh, is obviously there uh, in our uh, hospitals um, we haven't we we i haven't seen much of botulism and tick paralysis but they are uh, possible in indian icu probably snake bite becomes an important cause which is not there in this list so i just added it snake bite is an important cause and in our kind of setups another uh, disease which manifests with neuromuscular weakness uh, is organophosphorus poisoning which is and particularly intermediate syndromes or of organophosphorus poisoning which should also be kept in mind um als and its variants do rarely come but not very common uh polio is rare but there are some poliomyelitis like syndromes like the zika virus the west nile virus uh post polio syndromes and now that you know that uh, before the covid has uh, started going say some resurgence of zika virus in certain states of our country so that again brings us to zika virus so these are some of the neuromuscular causes of weakness uh, which we see in the icu so what do we do with this kind of patients what is our checklist how do we do a respiratory monitoring now any patient who comes with significant neuromuscular weakness uh, in the icu or we find significant neuromuscular weakness the first and most important or our majority efforts as intensivists remains in assuring that the airway is patent the patient is able to breathe and the circulation is maintained so that's the abc taking care of the airway patency uh uh breathing and ventilation and oxygenation and maintaining circulation uh maintaining the hemodynamics once these are uh taken care of or we figure out that the patient can maintain his or her airway the breathing is uh, not too labored he is not he or she is not in imminent respiratory failure and the hemodynamics are maintained we can look at the weakness and characterize the weakness as far as the symmetry is concerned is it symmetrical asymmetrical is it more proximal or distal um uh, is it involving uh lower limbs in preference to the upper limbs or vice versa is there involvement of the facial muscles facial weakness um ocular muscles extraocular muscles etc what is the mental status of the patient is the patient fully awake conscious but just be not being able to move much or is the mental status of the patient uh, also low um if you can figure out fasciculations that is great but uh, uh, most of our intensivists are bad clinicians so we most of the time fail to figure out whether as fasciculations or not reflexes uh, should be tested uh, as far as practical and sensory most of the time uh, we we uh, fail to do a sensory examination because the patients in the icu on ventilation and sick and they are not very uh, it's difficult to do a sensory level examination it's also important to look at certain lab parameters like the electrolytes uh as i mentioned that some of the electrolytes can contribute to significant neuromuscular weakness like potassium like phosphates magnesium calcium etc 
liver function, renal function, CPK, uh, Dr. Tapesh already mentioned, the creatinine kinase levels. In myopathy, particularly, the CPKs can go very high. Polymyositis, it can go very high. Uh, thyroid function tests are usually tested uh, simultaneously um, whenever we are diagnosed myasthenia or many other autoimmune diseases. Uh, blood sugar levels, um, ESR, these are things which are also checked. Relevant imaging, if we are suspecting that there may be a lesion in the uh, brain or in the spinal cord, uh, relevant imaging is important. Brainstem lesions can result in neuromuscular weakness. Higher cervical spine lesions can obviously lead to uh, neuromuscular weakness. And um, nerve conduction velocity, NCVs, and EMGs, again, difficult to interpret and do EMGs in ICU because most of the time patients do not follow commands, but NCVs are much easier to do and are often done. CSF studies are sometimes helpful in diagnosing particular uh, neuromuscular diseases like the Guillain-Barre syndrome, where we can find an albuminocytological dissociation, but it has to be obviously differentiated from uh, other causes of uh, high protein in the CSF. If the neurologist feels an EEG may be done, uh, although rarely useful to diagnose neuromuscular diseases, uh, bedside spirometry six hourly is something that is uh, recommended for patients who come to the ICU for um, neuromuscular disease. But unfortunately, these are recommendations which are mostly seen in uh, uh, American textbooks. We have dedicated respiratory physicians and who carry bedside uh, spirometers and can do such measurements. But unfortunately, mo in most of our hospitals, we rarely do bedside spirometry, uh, I mean, diagnostic spirometries to measure vital capacities and uh, uh, maximum inspiratory pressures, etc. Nerve conduction velocities are um, obviously specialized tests and require specialized knowledge, and I'm definitely not the best person to talk on it. But there are certain uh, ways to figure out uh, what's going on with the NCV, and I think Dr. Bhatia will uh, enlighten us more on this. Uh, like, for example, slowing of nerve conduction can happen with demalating diseases, reduction of amplitude in CMAP with Chetan? Uh, sir, sir, it disconnected due to the some connectivity. Oh. Uh, Chandrasi, sir, I sent you the request. Please click on yes and allow option. Sir, please come back to the Chrome browser. I am sending you request. Uh, please click on yes and allow option. Sir, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, Sir, we can. I, 
Sir, can you hear me? I can hear you, Chetan, but I don't know you have to contact with Chandra Shish. Yes, can hear sir. sir. Sir, his voice is not audible. Sir, please sir, rejoin again. Uh, just my apologies to everybody in the audience. Uh, just two minutes, the, the disconnection in the transmission. Uh, sir, sir is disconnected. Uh, can you inform him to rejoin again? Okay, I will do it. Have you sent the link? Which which link? Yes, sir. Yes. So he has to join to the new link. No, sir. Same link. No. Have you sent any other link or the previous link only? Sir, uh, right now you are sending the uh, link. That is. Hello, Doctor Chandrajit. You got disconnected. Uh, can you join again through the link? He's saying, Chetan is saying. Yeah, you have. Yeah, okay. So you have to join again. Huh? If you have come on the just I can see your name on the screen. Sir, voice is audible to you? Voice is uh, just, uh, just try to join. Yeah. Again. Uh, okay. yeah, why the voice is not audible? I'm not understanding actually. Yeah, the voice is not coming through. That's a problem. So Chetan, he has joined. Even he's saying the voice is not coming through. Wait, wait, sir. I'm sending you request. Please click on yes and allow option. Hello, can you hear me, sir? I've already, I've already clicked yes. it. Uh... Yes, yes. We can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, please yeah, share your screen now? again. Yes, yes. Okay. Where is it coming? Am I audible now? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, sir, yes. yes. Uh, was this slide uh, shown yes. before or yes. uh, should yes, I go yes. back? No, no, this is done. This slide was done. This is the last slide. Done. Done. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, sorry for the uh, glitch. Uh, okay, so we'll back with the uh, uh, with a little bit more of uh, respiratory dysfun muscle dysfunction and neuromuscular weakness. In respiratory muscles, we have basically three groups. Uh, the first is the diaphragm, uh, which is supplied, as you all know, by the C3, 4, and 5. It is mostly active in inspiration. And the diaphragm weakness causes paradoxical indrawing of upper abdomen during inspiration. So this is something which uh, these are clinical uh, parameters which uh, help us to figure out if we are dealing with a diaphragmatic weakness. The intercostals are mostly supplied by the T1 to T12 and they are involved in forced expiration and also in inspiration. On inspiration, the ribs 1 to 6 move anteriorly and the ribs 7 to 10 move laterally. Uh, in case of any paresis because of spinal cord lesions uh, in particular, there will be rib cage uh, indrawing uh, during rapid nasal inspiration. The accessory muscles, which are the lats dorsi, um, they uh, are activated whenever there's a high work of breathing or there is an unmet ventilatory demand. If the patient is already on ventilator, we can check for a rapid shallow breathing index, which is um, uh, usually less than 50. And if it is more than 105, then that's one of the contraindications of weaning a patient from the ventilator. Uh, 
Uh, ABG, unfortunately, is unreliable in assessing respiratory muscle weakness because most of the time the patients can try to maintain minute ventilation with rapid shallow breathing. And then uh, suddenly uh, there is respiratory arrest. Restlessness can be one of the early signs of fatigue and CO2 buildup. Now, pulmonary function tests by bedside spirometry, which we have been discussing, is somewhat theoretical, but we'll still say because these are numbers which are often asked in the examination. Uh, force vital capacity is normally more than 65 mils per kg, and the intubation threshold is usually less than 15 mils per kg. Less than 10 mils per kg, you have rise in carbon dioxide or hypercapnia. Once the patient's uh, the vital capacity falls below 15 ml per kg, they usually cannot count 20 in a single breath, which is a very common bedside uh, test, a rough estimation that is uh, done by uh, physicians. Abnormal force viral capacity, however, may be from both pulmonary as well as extra pulmonary causes, that is neuromuscular weakness. So if you have a normal FBC, that usually rules out any significant neuromuscular disease affecting the respiratory muscles. However, a low FVC can be because of lung disease as well. Negative inspiratory force of more than 70 is usually common, uh, also called maximum inspiratory pressure. And if it's less than 20 centimeters of water, that will cause poor uh, insufflation of the lung and cause atelectasis. Peak expiratory flow is usually more than 100 centimeters. If it is less than 40 centimeter water, that means poor cuff. So this will lead to accumulation of mucus plugs and this will lead to um, uh, lung uh, atelectasis again. ABG is not useful till the patient goes into respiratory arrest. I already mentioned while trying to maintain mechanical ventilation using accessory muscles and rapid shallow breaths. So please do not give too much of importance to the ABG because ABG may remain bang normal till the patient uh, crashes. Intensive is just told by assessing the work of breathing and talking to the person to see if he can finish his sentence without going out of breath definitely plays an important role. Uh, and it's better to be early to secure the airway or giving uh, respiratory support than to be late and end up in a crash intubation in such patients. Uh, just, uh, why uh, is can, I, can I just add uh, one thing? So uh, that was very important, like Dr. Chandrashi uh, sir said, especially your uh, vital capacity, and also I think uh, maybe we'll talk about it your NIFIA. So you NIF and the rough count that we do actually is the SBC, the single breath count. And how do you do it? Just uh, you have to take a deep breath. I mean, the patient has to take a deep breath and then count to twenty. And if he's not able to count to twenty, that means that he is a likely candidate for intubation and this roughly correlates with the cutoff numbers that he has given. So just want to tell you about SBC for those who may not be aware of it. Please sir, carry on. Thank you. Uh, now why is pulmonary function tests or bedside spirometry a little bit of theoretical? Because uh, there are certain problems in these patients which uh, become, uh, which basically makes it difficult to do such measurements. Uh, sometimes in patients, the bulbar weakness in these uh, neuromuscular diseases, sometimes bulbar weakness can precede respiratory muscle or limb weakness. So in that case, what happens is that there is oropharyngeal muscle collapse, tongue fall, and increased work of breathing against a closed airway. Uh, nasal regurgitation or a nasal staccato kind of a speech or bifacial paralysis are early clues to uh, involvement of the uh, 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 early clues to bulbar weakness and oropharyngeal muscle weakness, which can be contributing to the, uh, the respiratory distress. If there's a bifacial paresis, that will lead to inaccurate measurements of the vital capacity, the negative inspiratory force, as well as peak expiratory force, because the patient is not being able to maintain a seal around the uh, nozzle of the spirometer. So again, it will not be possible. Expiratory muscle fatigue usually results in weak cuff and, as I mentioned, inability to count 20 in a single breath, as Dr. Tapesh also explained. And inspiratory muscle fatigue results in recruitment of accessory muscles. So accessory muscles activated 
a lot of accessory muscles trying to work means there is also inspiratory muscle fatigue. Now coming to the act of intubation. So if in respiratory failure or there is an aspiration risk from bulbar weakness, these patients need to be intubated and ventilated. Uh, classically, uh, the description of intubation in ICU for these patients, if uh, one goes by the textbooks of critical care, it says that patients should undergo a rapid sequence intubation with a fixed dose of anesthetic drugs which should be given together and then the patient without much of ventilation, uh, without much of uh, bagging should be ventilated. However, I personally prefer to do a delayed sequence intubation with titrated dose of etomidate, uh, particularly in patients with uh, GB syndrome. Uh, and this is basically to avoid post-intubation crash. Uh, I've seen quite a few patients where there has significant autonomic problems and there is significant hypotension and bradycardia during and around the time of intubation, particularly if you give a fixed dose of anesthetic drugs, uh, which most of the patients do not tolerate very well. Um, if neuromuscular diseases like myasthenia, uh, uh, neuromuscular diseases uh, like uh, any kind of myopathy, myotonia, uh, Gulenberry syndrome, etc. If they are suspected, we should obviously avoid succinamethonium um, uh, because that can cause uh, significant hyperkalemia and hyperkalemic arrest in these patients. Rocuronium is safe, uh, but again, in patients with myasthenia, uh, rocuronium uh, should be avoided or if given, it should be given in less dose. And succinamethonium uh, unusually is ineffective in myasthenia um, because uh, it doesn't work in myasthenics. The, uh, if rocuronium is used, for example, particularly during surgery, uh, thoracotomy, for, for example, uh, thymectomy surgeries, uh, video-assisted thoracic surgeries for thymectomy, uh, obviously these patients need to be paralyzed during the surgery. So rocuronium is the best uh, drug which is used. And nowadays we have uh, neuromuscular blocker reversal agents like Sugamadex. If it is available, then it's always best to reverse rocuronium with Sugamadex. Um, and that will definitely help patients who are already having myasthenia. The role of NIV in rehabilitation, home care and stable patients will be discussed uh, later. Now, coming to certain definitions, uh, first is myasthenic crisis. What is a crisis? Crisis is weakness, which is severe enough to need ventilation or airway protection. Also, if there is a delayed extubation beyond 24 hours after any surgery uh, in a myasthenia patient, that can be referred to as myasthenic crisis. Uh, almost 40% of these patients will either have a myasthenic crisis precipitated by a respiratory infection or idiopathic. That means not no definite reason found. Uh, obviously, in other cases, there will be certain medications which have precipitated the crisis, trauma, surgery, or sepsis, which is precipitating the crisis. But the most common is still respiratory causes and respiratory infections like pneumonia. Coming to ventilation and weaning in myasthenia, the standard uh, ventilation strategies of protective lung ventilation will be used because that is lung protective. We should avoid all drugs which can precipitate weakness like certain antibiotics. We all know aminoglycoside group of antibiotics, polymyxines already mentioned, um, um, clindamycin, um, macrolides, quinolones, all these can cause problems. Neuromuscular blockers can definitely cause problems. Magnesium sulfate injection can cause problems. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, they can cause problems. So all these drugs should be better avoided. Sometimes we cannot completely avoid, but if possible, we should better avoid. Uh, check for power of neck flexors uh, when the patient is about to get weaned, because that is one of the early signs that uh, neck flexor power uh, corresponds well with uh, the uh, respiratory muscle powers and uh, also to uh, also look at the 
um, you know vital capacity on the ventilator it's possible to check for vital capacity uh, on the ventilator if the on a pressure support mode uh, if the patient has diarrhea uh, or bronchospasm or respiratory weakness a uh, drooling of saliva excessive tearing etc then uh, we should think about cholinergic crisis particularly if the patient is already receiving uh, mestinol that is pyrostigmine uh, although we talk a lot about cholinergic crisis but uh, uh, it is not very commonly seen at least i haven't seen probably because we work with very good neurologists who uh, rarely overdose uh, patients with uh, anti cholinergic uh, cholinergic drugs now the three risk factors uh, with pro which will cause prolonged ventilation are age more than 50 years uh, within the first week of intubation if the force vital capacity remains less than 25 mls per kg and if your uh, serum bicarbonate is more than 30 these are risk factors which leads to prolonged uh, ventilation up uh, to 20 Yeah, uh, yeah. So there is, a, uh, I think, yeah. You just com just complete the slide. There's a question which has come up. Yeah, up to twenty five percent of these patients may, however, need to be reintubated after extubation, and up to forty percent of myasthenics may need to uh, undergo tracheostomy. Uh, so, yes, Doctor Tapish, go ahead with the question. Yeah, so I just ask this question, sir, Doctor uh, uh, Badia, sir, if you want to take this, what is the role of neck holding and inability to raise hand above shoulder? in assessing diaphragmatic weakness so oh, i think it is uh, difficult to say that there is a direct correlation because uh, raising the hand uh, proximal weakness may be absolute i mean the absolute uh, you know you can say uh, uh, qualitative uh, detection of proximal weakness may be difficult in the icu setting and a gross proximal weakness is generally assessed by shoulder abduction and shoulder raising so of course the question is relevant to the dermatomal supply which uh, the colleague is uh, pointing towards but this kind of weakness could exist in a patient which is isolated from it being a truly a uh, indicator of a diaphragmatic weakness and will clearly depend on the localization you may have a patient with a muscle weakness which also may be due to neck holding as well as due to you know the proximal weakness related to uh, the deltoid or the serrati and it could also be an anterior horn cell weakness at that level which may raise a concern that there could be an evolving or an impending diaphragmatic weakness so it could make us more cautious but i'm not certain that it is an absolute indicator that it will correlate with diaphragmatic weakness in all patients uh, I, thank you sir i would also like to add that the use of ultrasound in assessing diaphragmatic weakness directly would be kind of uh, very helpful and if the patient has been on the, diaph uh, the ventilator for some time then diaf uh, venti ventilator induced uh, diaphragmatic dysfunction would occur independent of any other muscles you know you, you are talking about correlating it with the other muscles but the diaphragm may be affected just the diaphragm by ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction which may be out of proportion to the other muscles and like i said ultrasound can directly visualize the contractility and the thickness shortening of the diaphragm i hope that answers your question uh, dr rupak so sir what do you dr chandrashish sir yeah so um, a little bit about non invasive ventilation in uh, neuromuscular diseases niv has been used uh, by quite some uh, physicians before putting them on a invasive ventilation uh, and also for as a transition during weaning uh, with some success in some series uh, when the patient is weaned from an invasive ventilator to a non invasive ventilator one thing is uh, important that uh, niv is not useful if you have bulbar weakness and if you have risk of aspiration in that case obviously you have to secure the airway if securing the airway is not very important then non invasive ventilation may be tried in mild weakness uh where uh, patients may have some benefit because the risk of ventilator induced complications particular pneumonia is much less with niv uh 
um, also patients who, who are on uh, who are known diseases say known case of myasthenic will uh, but having an episode of uh, weakness uh, because of something that happened maybe some medication maybe an illness uh, but they are not really very weak uh, these are patients who can be tried with niv even in hospital setting reasons for niv failure will be uh, or some of the risk factors for niv failure will be uh, if the co2 is going above 45 as i mentioned if there's bulbar weakness and risk of aspiration if the apache 2 score that is a score of uh, severe uh, systemic disease is high and if your bicarb is more than 30 that means you're already compensating for a high co2 so these are patients who usually have an niv failure so, so uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, sir, I just like to add to the bicarbonate. So, why the bicarbonate is actually like Dr. Chandrasekhar said, uh, your CO2 may fluctuate, right? When the patient is on the ventilator, either NIV or your invasive, you can increase the volume and the minute ventilation uh, and wash out the carbon dioxide, right? So, the carbon dioxide may not be that good. It can, it can go up and down with the amount of minute ventilation you're providing. But once the bicarb has gone up to compensate for the CO2, bicarb cannot change rapidly, you know, because bicarbonate compensation comes from the kidney, which is a, a slow process. It takes two to three days to kind of uh, adjust your bicarbonate to the CO2. So that is why we are using bicarbonate as greater than 30 in these uh, parameters. So that is just something I wanted to clarify why bicarbonate more than 30 is being used. Carry on, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, uh, because you have to support the inspiratory efforts, so the inspiratory positive airway pressure, there's an IPAP of NIV usually required is high than the EPAP. And uh, whether there are certain newer modes of NIV like the AVAPs, whether they may be useful or not, we don't have very good data. Uh, and it's unclear till now whether these AVAPs mode may have a benefit over uh, standard uh, modes. Uh, but all patients who are pushed on, uh, placed on NIV needs a very close watch you can ventilate somebody and go for a cup of coffee but if somebody is on an niv i think you need to stay very close and see with how the patient is tolerating the niv because they can again as i mentioned fail on niv and suddenly crash and so uh, it's very important that you have a close watch on such patients chronically some patients um, with these diseases may receive or continue to receive niv outside the ICU, still in the hospital or even home, uh, particularly if they are still suffering from fatigue, dyspnea, orthopnea, morning headaches, carbon dioxide continues to remain more than 45, or if you do a pulse oximetry at night during sleep and find that there is a nocturnal desaturation of less than 88% for more than five minutes, and if your forced vital capacity is less than 50% of predicted, they will need chronic NIV uh, therapy. There is some other forms of respiratory assist which are particularly important for rehabilitation and the difficult patients who just do not get out of uh, ventilation uh, or NIV. They need slow respiratory muscle training. They need manual cuff assists, hyperinflation with ambu bagging uh, from time to time. And there are certain cuff assist devices. I've shown a picture of one of the cuff assist devices here, uh, which may be used if you have poor cuff uh, reflex. And these cuffesis devices helps you to clear the secretions and prevent atelectasis and mucus plugging. Treatment, I don't want to talk much about because this is really not my forte. This is uh, definitely decided by the neurologist. But just an outline, um, plasma pheresis or IVIG, both can be used for uh, treatment uh, of myasthenia gravis. Um, there is uh, plasma pheresis. There are some uh, data that uh, it may lead to early resolution of crisis. Uh, however, IVIG has much a uh, lot more advantages. For example, you don't need uh, a special machine and line and all the complications of the blood products, etc. Uh, steroids. Uh, if you are starting on steroid, they should be started in hospital gradually in titrated doses because a large dose of steroids can itself precipitate. Uh, weakness. Long-term uh, steroid sparing agents like uh, uh, the MMF, mycophenolates, uh, azathioprine, etc. will be added by the neurologist. Uh, 
but uh, usually not started while on ventilator most of the time because uh, again as i said one of the most important problems of ventilation is uh, uh, infection and immunosuppression more of immunosuppression leads to more infection risk pyridostigmine is usually stopped in crisis uh, uh, restarted just before extubation in slow titrated doses um, uh, thymectomy uh, sometimes uh, may be used as a part of the treatment but uh, that is again uh, depends on particular cases uh, anti uh, you know, antibody positive or not for antidepressant receptors, what is the age of the patient, etc. And if despite all this immunosuppression, patient remains to be difficult to come out of crisis, then some, sometimes rituximab is used, but obviously uh, that is at the discretion of the neurologist. So uh, this will be, uh, I, I know, I don't know whether Dr. Bhatia wants to comment here, uh, yeah. because yeah. I think this is, a, this is, this yeah. is something which is definitely his, uh, his forte to talk about. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Bhatia, sir, you'd like to talk about a little about the treatment part in the ICU, the kind of prognosis, how long do they stay, uh, plasma phoresis, vis a vis IVIG. So, so, your comments, sir, on the treatment in the ICU and the me how many patients die, something like that. You know. So, you know, these typical patients of myasthenia, the crisis is generally precipitated by an incipient uh, infection which they carry or they get or if they have been slightly erratic about their uh, anti based drugs or they have withdrawn the medications or reduced the doses themselves with, uh, with, without a consultation with their treating physician. So these are the usual causes, the most common being infection as a trigger for myasthenic crisis. What is most important in myasthenic crisis at the time that they present is of course their ABC and I think their, their respiratory assessment and respiratory stabilization is the key and as has been well elucidated in the in the slides by Dr. Chandra. Uh, I think that remains a very very important factor for key factor for stabilization and survival for these patients that they don't become hypoxemic and they you know don't get worse related to the ventilation. Once you have established a good ventilatory assistance, the second most important thing is to quickly work up and look for any evidence of infection. And if there is a suggestion of infection, start the treatment early so that the infection is controlled. And of course, choose the appropriate antibiotic uh, without compromising neuromuscular blockade. And, and, and I think it's well known to people that, that there are specific antibiotics which are clearly prohibited in patients with myasthenia. The third thing is about acute immunomodulation and no reasons to say that they have to be started as soon as possible. Uh, between plasma phrases or IVIG, uh, there is no strong evidence to say that one is superior to the other. I think many factors come into the play to make the decision. Uh, if you really think logically, uh, this is an antibody mediated disease with a lot of, uh, you know, other uh, uh, collaborated, uh, you can say, uh, immunological, uh, you know, cascade of, of uh, activities which go on in these patients. So, particularly uh, <coughs> plasma phrases is a is a good option where you can actually filter out most of these uh, these uh, these antibodies and other elements. But IVIG also works in a pleiotropic way and and blocks most of these antibody bodies from you know acting and dimerization of the pathogenic antibodies. So I would say that uh, depending on the situation you are in, depending on the hemodynamic stability of the patient, depending on how serious the patient's autonomic dysfunction in myasthenia is, many factors will go into play to make a decision. So we experience uh, with both plasma cases or IVIG and uh, in, in patients where it seems reasonable, we will start at plasma phoresis. In patients where we feel that plasma phoresis may have a relative or absolute contraindication or excess issues or patients is too hemodynamically unstable, IVIG would be preferred. Cost-wise, I think uh, it depends on which situation you are and which hospital you work. The cost may not be too different, but in our setting, plasma phoresis seems to be much cheaper than IVIG. Uh, but in, in, if you look at the data from the, the West, the plasma phrases is clearly much, much more expensive 
and I don't know about the settings in the private hospitals. Maybe Dr. Chandra can allude on that. The cost may not be too different, or maybe even higher. So I think that is something which needs to be started very promptly and very early in the course of a myasthenic crisis. As far as long-term treatment is concerned, I think that's a clear, um, not a very difficult decision making, and it all depends on which age patient you are looking at, what are the comorbidities, uh, whether patient has other issues. But typically, steroids are the are the treatment of choice to start with. Start slow, build up, and then add a collateral immunosuppressant therapy, oral either with azathioprine or mycophenolate. I personally prefer azathioprine because of its long experience and it's uh, quite an effective agent in our experience. But where you have issues or where patient is a TPMT, uh, you know, low enzyme activity patient, MMF would be preferred. We do choose rituximab for recalcitrant patients or patients who require higher doses of steroids and in spite of reaching a full dose or a, you can say the uh, the highest dose of azathioprine or mycophenolate patient still is, you know, continuing with persistent myasthenia or has frequent exacerbations of, or persistent myasthenic weakness. Uh, Rituximab remains a good choice, uh, although the data is observational and experience based, but definitely could be tried and makes logical sense since it's a B cell blocker. So, thymectomy, um, as far as the role of thymectomy is concerned, it has always been controversial ever since it was used. Uh, on a frank note, we prefer to do thymectomy in most of the patients who are young, below 50 years of age, and who have well controlled myasthenia at the time. And many of the patients currently undergo video assisted thymectomy. Uh, apart from the patients which have large masses and who clearly have thymic mass or a thymic carcinoma, where an open removal is maybe necessary in a given scenario. Uh, as far as efficacy is concerned, uh, there is still not a very, I mean, the, the, uh, I would say that we don't have a, a definite answer to that, but it's a variable efficacy as far as thymectomy in young people are concerned, but definitely people with clearly thymic enlargement or thymic masses, uh, they do definitely better than ones who may not have any thymic enlargement. But this is something we prefer uh, in most of our young patients of myasthenia gravis to accept the risk benefit and the uncertainty of benefit uh, as far as treatment is concerned. So I think apart from that, uh, in the acute management, uh, most of the care is, of course, the ICU supported care, and which is well being elucidated already. So, Dr. Chandra, you can continue. I think I, have, I mean, from yeah. that perspective, I have nothing more to add. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bhatia. Just an anecdote, I still remember uh, the neurology department used to send uh, uh, patients for video-assisted uh, thoracoscopic surgeries and thymectomies when I was in uh, All India Institute. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we have definitely... Pretty, yeah, it is pretty uh, regular now. We had a small stint of COVID-related, you know, stoppage because of the yeah, yeah. services. Right. But even the last week, we got two patients who have been operated. Both are in the age group of 25 to 30, and they well understood, and they were uh, convinced, and they themselves preferred that they would like to undergo a thymectomy. Yes, and I think there is some data that the uh, the number of crises comes down after uh, thymectomy in young patients, yeah. and probably their dose of uh, immunosuppressants also. And most yeah. of these patients that we have seen in the ICU, they remain. Uh, in the ICU for 24 to 48 hours before they can be shifted out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Thymectomy is actually done after stabilization and not, uh, you know, once he is in the ICU. I think he has to be well stabilized before any thymectomy is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So there would be, Dr. Tipesh, some such very rare moments in, in our experience where you have a patient of, of myasthenic crisis who also has a huge thymic mass and, and that is obviously producing a lot of antibodies as a paraneoplastic manifestation. And sometimes in those situations, once you have stabilized them, it may be prudent to take up early for thymectomy because the situation is different than someone who may be having a thymic, thymus may not be enlarged or maybe just slightly, you know, uh, hypertrophic, but not, not malignant or from that matter, not like a real tumor which is like shedding off a lot of antibodies so you we do experience such anecdotal concerns in some of these patients right right 
So, sir, what about the wards in the ICU? Like, uh, what? How many uh, approximately percentage of patients come out in two, three weeks and do not require long-term uh, tracheostomy and they stay in the ICU? I so, think I'm, uh, difficult for me to give an up up and data uh, uh, as far as that is concerned. But I think it's a variable phenomena for patients who have a clear-cut reason. For myasthenic crisis, like an infection, and we've been able to take care of the infection. Started parallel their immunomodulation, like IVIG or Plex. I think most of them do tend to get weaned off and and get off the when uh, off the ICU in uh, roughly in anything from 10 to 14 days. But there are patients who we've had issues and who have stayed in the ICU for like days to weeks and ended up preostomized and where we had to do. Repeated immunomodulation with either IVIG or plasma paralysis. So I think it's a very variable thing. But for people who have otherwise been on treatment and who have had a stable history, uh, an a trigger triggered myasthenic crisis. Generally, most of them come out well. That's what my personal experience. Right. Uh, So, uh, should we move on with the uh, presentation? I think, Dr. Chandra, you can because the page, the video is frozen, so we may be having some connectivity issues. Uh, uh, am I? I mean, the video is frozen. Yeah, I think he's uh, now disconnected, so maybe he's okay. going to reconnect again. Maybe you okay. can go on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, just uh, was one slide about post-operative uh, myasthenic crisis. Uh, myasthenia gravis diagnosis uh, may be done post-op also if there is a failure to extubate within 24 hours for poor respiratory efforts. And uh, whenever there is somebody who comes to the ICU because the patient uh, could not be extubated post-op because of poor respiratory efforts, we also check for thyroid function uh, tests and electrolytes, etc. And myasthenia is something which we keep at the back of our mind. Uh, myasthenic crisis after thymectomy is also known and common. The incidence is something between 12 to 34 percent, depending upon the centers and depending upon how well controlled that patient is. The history of myasthenic crisis um, in the past or if preoperatively they have bulbar weakness or if their acetylcholine receptor antibody levels are high and if the intraoperative blood loss is more than a liter, these are some of the risk factors for postoperative myasthenic crisis after thymectomy. So if possible, uh, we can try to uh, uh, select patients accordingly. And uh, or if possible, we can modify some of these risk factors uh, to avoid post-operative crisis in, uh, th after thymectomy. Now coming to another uh, major player uh, among neuromuscular disease in the ICU, that's the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, Obviously, is an old disease named after two uh, Frenchmen, if I'm not wrong. Progressive weakness of all four limbs. Uh, the history uh, from few days and up to four weeks from the triggering event sometimes. Um, along with areflexia. Uh, tr the triggering event sometimes uh, can be uh, found. For example, a diarrheal episode, a respiratory uh, tract infection, etc. The nerve conduction velocity findings are obviously helpful, but they are uh, very complex. Uh, they depend upon the uh, timeline, whether you are catching the patient early in the disease or late in the disease. Uh, the type of uh, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, whether it's a classical uh, inflammatory demyelination or is it involving the axons uh, like the Aman and uh, AMSN uh, types. Or is it the CSF, which uh, sometimes shows albuminocytological dissociation? But again, it mostly starts, uh, this is particularly evident in the second week uh, when you have a high uh, albumin level in CSF, but uh, l the number of cells are less than five. And these are all supportive of the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Cranial nerve involvement, particularly facial nerve involvement is common. Uh, bifacial paralysis is often seen. Autonomic dysfunction is common and is something that intensivists fear a lot. I'll say why uh, in the next few slides. And there is usually relative symmetry of weakness, which is seen. Uh, 
mostly the weakness will start from the lower limbs and ascend upwards but the reverse do sometimes happen mechanical ventilation in gbs so respiratory failure and autonomic dysfunction are the two most life threatening complications of gbs and the difference between dbs and myasthenia is that in gbs usually the respiratory failure is somewhat uh, gradual we can predict that the patient respiratory function is worsening worsening and now it's time we should give it support myasthenic however uh, can have a rapid sudden worsening of respiratory status so most of the times this vi uh, uh, vital capacity monitoring and all this uh, doesn't doesn't uh, look to be too fruitful in myasthenics but these are more useful in gbs because you can predict worsening it's more gradual 10 to 30% of these patients require ventilation uh inadequate inspiratory effort ineffective expiratory force and inability to protect the airway uh, are the three main uh, causes for which neuromuscular disease patients get intubated and ventilated and unfortunately all these three problems can happen in gbs in poor inspiratory effort ineffective expiratory force and inability to protect the airway again strategies of ventilation are very simple protective ventilation strategies uh because the lungs are most of the time fine so nothing much there uh prevention of uh, ventral associated pneumonia and controlled ventilation as uh, uh, i think dr tapish mentioned uh, a little time back that the controlled ventilation itself leads to farther diaphragm atrophy and weak and uh, diaphragm weakness so uh, it is as soon as possible we should try to transition to at least a partial support uh, kind of ventilation where we are maybe it's sometimes necessary to give some mandatory breaths but uh, there should be some spontaneous breath so that the diaphragm continues to function because it's very important that uh, there is one disease which is uh, uh, causing respiratory muscle weakness we don't want the diaphragm to completely sit and relax uh because that is going to cause significant diaphragmatic muscle uh, atrophy uh gbs may need prolonged ventilation which can be anywhere between 2 weeks to 12 weeks or even more spontaneous breathing efforts sedation holidays are very very important as i mentioned and the sedation should be preferentially uh analgo sedation based which means analgesia is is the primarily primary objective uh, objective that is uh these patients do not need much of uh, uh sedatives uh, which is basically to help you sleep because that is something which we don't want we want to be want them to be awake but we want them comfortable pain free because there are obviously tubes and lines in your body and you are lying in place and also you have uh, these patients have bad muscle pains muscle cramps and uh, especially lower limb pain horrible lower limb pains and uh, they definitely sometimes need uh, pain management because of that so analgo sedation analgesia based uh, sedation with maybe drugs like fentanyl etc are good for them tracheostomy um usually is done uh, around 10th day of ventilation uh, not earlier than that um on starting ventilation the respiratory weakness may worsen over the next few days while on ivig and that should be kept in mind uh uh because uh, that is that is seen quite often and hemodynamics needs to be very closely monitored in the acute phase weaning the recovery of muscle power does not always predict successful weaning this is very important because sometimes we have uh, improvement of the power of uh a limb must a limb uh, a lower limb and upper limb but it always uh, definitely it's a good indicator that the respiratory muscles have also started recovering but sometimes we get foxed and we find that yes the patient can raise their hands but no the patient is still cannot breathe well so it does not always predict probably because of an underlying weakness of the diaphragm which is responsible for the low uh, maximum respiratory pressure and force vital capacity also the intercostal muscle weakness results in poor cuff uh, there is also a uh, post extubation respiratory failure and mucus plugs which can happen from intercostal muscle weakness uh 
there was a mention about diaphragmatic ultrasound before, which is uh, the role of diaphragmatic ultrasound is underutilized. Uh, may be useful to look at excursion of the diaphragm and thickening of the fibers in the zone of interposition, but I am not aware of any such studies which have been done, particularly in this group of critical ill patients uh, suffering from neuromuscular disease. That may be a good thing to look into. But in general, there has, uh, there has been quite an interest in the use of diaphragmatic ultrasound to assess uh, failure to wean in the ICU. Systemic factors uh, obviously contribute to weaning problems, which is ICU acquired weakness. The more the patient lives in the ICU and stays on ventilators, you have a contribution of ICU acquired weakness along with GBS. Uh, low phosphates, low potassium, low magnesium, so all that needs to be controlled and taken care of. There are no special weaning modes uh, which has demonstrated any superiority. Most of the people still prefer to use pressure support ventilation or proportional assist ventilations are sometimes used. NAVA is a, uh, um, uh, NAVA is a very uh, new, uh, not very new, but is a weaning method which has been proposed for patients with neuromuscular diseases, uh, which has got some theoretical advantages, but uh, most of the time at the bedside, it has not proved very successful or very user friendly. And um, there are issues with the uh, with the catheter, which is put down the nose for stimulation of the diaphragm, etc. SIMV weaning is slower uh, than pressure support weaning, but sometimes it is used to prevent to provide mandatory breaths, as I mentioned, uh, if you cannot completely rely on spontaneous breaths and you need some mandatory breaths, SIMV may be used. Nowadays, we rarely use SIMV uh, in most of the settings, but this may be an, uh, an exception. Weaning may precipitate autonomic swings in blood pressure. This is very something, some, uh, something uh, which um, one should remember, particularly uh, once started, uh, once weaning starts, you can find the blood pressure has become 240, 210 of systolic blood pressure. And then the patient goes into sudden respiratory distress and hypoxic because of a pulmonary edema or a heart failure that has been precipitated, particularly in elderly patients. So close monitoring is required. The best predictor uh, for weaning, uh, as far as research is concerned, has been an increase in vital capacity by more than 4 mils per kg from the pre-intubation values. The act of securing airway is tricky and risky in GBS. And this is due to maximum autonomic involvement among the other neuromuscular disease that we see. If you compare with GBS and ICU acquired weakness and other myopathies and polymyositis and whatever. Uh, there there uh, has been quite a few case reports and we have seen ourselves uh, practically that there can be profound hypotension and bradycardia, even leading to cardiac arrest, which can happen with rapid fixed dose bolus of anesthetics while trying to secure the airway. So prepare early from clinical judgment, avoid crash intubation. It needs expert hands, even if the, air, uh, the, uh, the airway of the person looks simple, but it needs expert hands. You need to numb the airway reflex as far as possible. Quick, single uh, laryngoscopic intubation, graded sedation. If there is axonal involvement uh, seen in, in nerve conduction velocity, then early tracheostomy may be preferred because these patients usually need prolonged ventilation and have scorer prognosis. But otherwise, usually tracheostomy is done in the second week. Mortality in good intensive care setups uh, in the current day is not too high. Uh, all complications of prolonged ventilation ICU stay can happen in these patients. India lacks good respiratory rehab facilities. That's a problem. So patients who get stuck on the ventilator, we cannot move them to respiratory rehabs like in uh, other countries, but we have to continue their care in the main in the ICU, which makes two problems. One, the cost of care goes up and two, secondary infection rates remains high. Home ventilation is still in two nascent stage. So that is also a big problem. The axonal uh, involvements, the uh, patterns which causes axonal involvement uh, have more protracted courses and they have more difficult weaning. If some residual weakness remains, but there is no bulbar weakness, then home NIV may be an option. And I've already mentioned about that before. 
again treatment ivig or plasma pheresis any one i don't think there is any advantage of one over the other there's no role of probably combining both important to give trauma prophylaxis to these patients because they are at high risk of dvt particularly those who are getting ivigs uh, important to give them good nutrition particularly uh, with uh, good protein content so that they do not develop uh, uh, you know muscle uh, loss of muscles which we call sarcopenia careful mobilization by the physiotherapist this is important because sometimes mobilization of this patient from the bed to the chair can cause the blood pressure to drop or swing or bradycardia and all that so careful mobilization and pain control is important sometimes they need drugs like gabapentin carbamazepines uh, really opi opioids morphine particularly should be probably avoided because of again uh, autonomic problems with morphine but other kinds of uh, weaker opioids may be used if the pain is too much but usually the gabapentin and carbamazepine group of drugs are used for pain control uh, lower limb pains and muscle cramps that these patients have uh, again i'll stop here i'll uh, ask dr batia if he has anything to contribute about the treatment because again this is not really my forte uh, so thank you chandra i think you alluded okay dr batia just one question if the patient does not respond to the initial course of ivig or plasma pheresis uh, there is some role of repeating another uh, course and at uh, how much duration so uh, that's a very good question and that's a question we we keep on discussing on our rounds as well when people do not show you know signs of getting better over the next week 10 15 days the unfortunate part of the patients that we could not have a uh, very clear cut you know what we call the natural course of recovery in most of these we know that the recovery can go on uh, till one year and almost 85 to 90% of the patients will make a good recovery the ones who survive unfortunately the ones who uh, die because of complications uh, but the these the trajectory of improvement cannot be equated in all patients with the same in the same way so whether a patient is going to take one month to start getting better reasonably or two weeks is very variable among such patients and depends on of course the severity and the impact of the immunological damage to the nerves saying that uh, uh, this is a important aspect that we we uh, the if you go by the evidence and the evidence does not support strongly that repeated doses or repeated uses of these agents uh, really work well or they really change outcomes but in a given patient who's not showing response to an initial immunomodulation i personally feel it is worthwhile and we do that in practice to redo uh, retreat these patients so typically in a scenario where we have done uh, initially a plasma pheresis and we look for the benefit or recovery over the next let's say a week or two weeks and we feel that no the process seems to be very slow and we are worried about the patient's lack of improvement we would give an ivig course add on to that uh, even though it has a minuscule evidence base now the problem happens if you have done ivig first and you are waiting and then you think okay maybe ivig did not work i should go ahead with plasma pheresis so there is this theoretical concern what is the best time window to do plasma pheresis because you don't want to probably remove the antibodies that you have given in a high fraction outside as igg so we really don't know what is the best time but i feel reasonably maybe because the peak of peak effect of ibig is also said to happen anything in from a week to two weeks after the after the initial uh, regimen so uh, whether two weeks would be a reasonable time to flex these people or you are or you are concerned and you want to push it to three weeks at the same time the the dichotomy of thought is that would it be too late for us to do that because the impact of the disease may lead to irreversible damage or maybe a slowing down benefit of treatment so i guess uh, a repeat therapy anything around 10 to 14 days from the initial therapy or maybe around 2 weeks from the initial therapy some people say maybe 3 to 4 weeks may be a reasonable choice but we don't give them together ever we we always would wait for one uh therapies effect uh to to be observed over the ensuing week to two weeks so the question doesn't have an absolute answer but i would say uh 
in practice sometimes when we see very severe gps patients uh, it may be worthwhile trying another uh, uh, element of immunomodulation uh, either with a repeat ivig or uh, or plex followed by ivig we haven't been very frequently uh, going ahead and doing repeated plex apart from very small number of patients uh, because of the convenience and and difficulty to the patient so maybe ivig may be a better option uh, to do that in such situation but it may be worth trying i i personally feel it may be worth trying okay. uh, thank you sir uh, dr is that all on gbs or uh, yeah. just, okay so i just want to add about the autonomic swings uh, which dr chandrashree has highlighted and he has said you have to be very careful with this kindly do not use any long acting agents for example if there is a tachycardia uh, you know you should stick to uh, shorter acting either you give a small dose of metoprolol or if it is persisting then esmolol because esmolol has a very short half life and similarly if it is going into bradycardia then use atropine and if there is hypotension give fluids or uh, you know give some noradrenaline and so whatever agent you use should have a very short half life because these are springs and they can dominate very rapidly and if you give something the long acting it can be counterproductive that is one thing i wanted to add about the autonomic dysfunction second feeding sometimes can be a problem because the autonomic dysfunction actually leads to a gastropathy and ileus so you may not be able to feed enterally and you may have to go on for tpn and uh, the other thing is they are immobilized all the time so physiotherapy has to be very good and supervised uh, these patients should not be ignored in terms of physiotherapy uh, sometimes they can actually drop we had patients who develop foot drops and all uh, bed sores are very common in them because they don't move at all right unlike the other patients so the physiotherapy and uh, dvt prophylaxis because they are immobilized so these general things about general care which pertain to the last slide itself uh, should be looked into so that, those are a few things i just wanted to add sir please go yeah. ahead yeah i would if i could uh, just ask from yeah. your experience and dr chandra's experience you know we come across frequently patients who develop a lot of this tachycardia of course uh, and that is the we find that you know change in heart rate and a bit of a fluctuation in the blood pressure seems to be a very uh, frequent observation when they are mounting the autonomic response uh, autonomic dysfunction and that time you know uh, we also look for whether the patient is being given any nebulization is he being given any drugs which is causing tachycardia Uh, we look at the ecg if there is any component of supraventricular tachycardia which is being triggered and that is a rhythm disease rhythm disorder rhythm issue which is developed most of them typically have sinus tachycardia as a part of their their autonomic dysfunction and so i wanted to ask uh, typically we've been using small doses of beta blockers like metoprolol small dose or there used to be a use with small dose of atenolol or propranolol as well so i wanted to know what is your experience uh, what would you do in a situation like this where it is where it is clearly consistently suggestive of an autonomic uh, autonomic dysregulation uh, sir uh, i think uh, we have to use iv uh, short acting just like i said you can try like you said yourself metoprolol iv and see if it's settling down if it's a persistent tachycardia for a longer time then esmolol infusion would be a good job esmolol has a very rapid offset and uh, we should not uh, give uh, oral drugs oral drugs have a prolonged effect and you know after 12 hours he can go into bradycardia so esmolol infusion for prolonged sinus tachycardia or any svts would be the way to go but we've been using a uh, small doses of because practically uh, using esmolol is like a prn drug may not be uh, practically possible for patients with a persistent you know tachy they are people who have persistent tachy and in those scenarios we have been using small doses a guided and a very gauged doses of oral beta blockers as well so i thought i would take your experience as to what you would suggest so if it's going i mean going on and on then uh, probably you can use uh, evabrad is not a bad option evabrad can also be used evabrad if you're talking about tablets but generally it's better to use iv uh, infusions of esmolol Uh, that would uh, be my choice and that is what we use normally or you can use sos doses of iv metoprolol and if you have to use a tablet like if it's going on and your convince is not coming down 
uh, you can use evabradin also it has only uh, you know anti tachycardic effect but the tablets are very dicey in this uh, situation according to our experience you know because they fluctuate rapidly and persistent tachycardia going on for 3 4 days is generally i mean it is i am not seeing so much and probably you are seeing many more cases right Thank you, sir yeah i think uh, uh, i don't have any separate uh, opinion about this but most of the time uh, i'll just say that if um, uh, sinus tachycardia uh, is definitely common in gbs patients but uh, if it is not causing much of problem for the patient or the not compromising the hemodynamics we can also kind of just uh, keep an eye on it uh, rather than treating and if it is uh, Uh, very fluctuating uh, tachybrady syndromes then obviously there is a uh, risk of treating with drugs which are little bit prolonged action but if it's consistent tachycardia and if you think then the patient is having palpitations or uh, 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 some other problems uh, uh, then ivabradin uh, or low dose beta blockers are probably the only choice that we should be using yeah Uh, I'll move on to the next part and the last part of the talk uh, because we're, I think we're also uh, closing on time. So, the last part of the talk is on ICU acquired weakness, also called critical illness uh, polyneuropathy, sometimes critical illness myopathy, or critical illness neuromyopathy. Um, critical illness um, uh, acquired weakness needs few uh, important. Uh, stems for identification or diagnosis number 1 the patient should be critically ill for some duration of time uh they usually start with limb weakness and um, lower limbs are first or more common uh also present with failure to wean or ventilation uh these patients if you do new nerve conduction tests they can have axonal motor or sensory polyneuropathy and there will be absence of decremental response and all these put together will be classical of critical illness polyneuropathy Crot critical illness polyneuropathy has a long term poor outcome and higher mortality if you compare with critical illness myopathy but many a times they happen together but particularly critical illness pol uh, polyneuropathy isolated has got a much poorer outcome and a higher mortality as i mentioned lower limbs are more affected and the facial muscles are uh, affected in much few patients so um, this is sometimes one of the tests one of the aspects of differentiating between uh, gb syndrome uh, and iso acquired weakness because they have more cranial nerve involvement iso acquired weakness will have much less or very few patients with facial muscle weakness uh, bilateral but Uh, strangely enough i have seen one or two patients who develop facial muscle weakness with iso acquired uh we um, develop facial muscle weakness we did csf and all that for them and there was nothing suggestive of gps uh, we can discuss on that later critical illness myopathy has slightly better outcome it mostly affects proximal muscles the recovery happens within 6 months one third of patients may have long term uh, limb and arm from weakness as well risk factors for iso acquired weakness or prevention uh, will involve uh, so what are the risk factors prolonged mechanical ventilation is definitely the most one of the most important risk factors if somebody develops septic shock or systemic inflammatory response syndrome from many other things for example pancreatitis trauma uh, uh, etc all of that can lead to iso acquired weakness poor glycemic control is uh, uh definitely one of the risk factors and a very important risk factor there are some suggestions that intravenous insulin and tight glycemic control can improve or reduce the uh incidence of iso acquired weakness however the recent studies of tight glycemic control um are fraught with the risk of uh more episodes of hypoglycemia and therefore are not very popular nowadays uh, in the uh the intensive care uh, society use of steroids are controversial whether they, re uh, they result in iso acquired weakness or not but definitely steroids cause poor glycemic control which definitely will worsen iso acquired weakness lack of early mobilization in the icu is definitely one of the risk factors so early mobilization uh, 
is uh, very important to prevent ICU acquired weakness. There are certain group of patients where we find mobilization difficult. For example, as we mentioned, uh, patients who are having uh, particular neurological diseases and neurological disorders uh, where mobilization is difficult, somebody with particular fractures where immobilization is difficult or patients who are very tied up with um, with uh, extracorporeal uh, therapies all the time, for example, ECMO, uh, where mobilization is difficult. And these patients develop very severe isoequivalence. Neurotoxic and myotoxic medications may also contribute to isoequivalence weakness. The uh, exact percentages are not clear or known. And prolonged infusion of neuromuscular blockers is an independent risk factor for weakness. And uh, again, particularly seen in patients who are uh, uh, difficult to ventilate or patients who are on prone ventilation or ECMO patients. And these are, uh, these are again, patients who are at the highest risk of ICU acquired weakness and most of the time uh, persistent weakness even after going back home. I will not go into the pathophysiological mechanism. This is uh, from New England Journal of Medicine 2014. There can be uh, many uh, causes from sodium channel dysfunction to nerve mitochondrial injury to muscle necrosis and to uh, microvascular injury leading to, uh, uh, leading to poor blood supply uh, at the uh, nerve, causing nerve ischemia. Uh, so all that leads to uh, isoacquired weakness. And detecting ISO-acquired weakness, there is something called the Medical Research Council SUM score, or the MRC score. And the uh, um, arbitrary cutoff of 48 is used to define ISO-acquired weakness. This is more of a, for an exam purpose because most of the time do, uh, doing this MRC scoring in uh, all group of muscles and, doing, uh, and uh, uh, scoring under five categories is not only difficult but uh, kind of impractical in ICU patients uh, because uh, they don't the, most of the time they may, may not be able to follow commands and they are delirious etc etc but anyways uh, this is uh, the MRC score of more than 48 which is required and has been adopted for use within the ICU to define ICU acquired use, uh, weakness the incidence of ICU acquired weakness varies just by mechanical ventilation of four days, uh, there can be an ISO acquired weakness of in up to 25% patients. ARDS uh, patients has a significant risk of 25 to 75%. ICU stay of more than one week with multi-organ failure, systemic inflammatory response, or sepsis will have an ISO acquired weakness of more than 50%. And if the patient is uh, on mechanical ventilation for coma or septic shock, on vasopressors, almost 100% of them will develop ISO acquired weakness. So that is the incidence and that is the uh, uh, frequency with which we see ISO acquired weakness. And it's kind of a very big problem in the uh, intensive care unit. The electrophysiological uh, features of critical illness polyneuropathy and critical illness myopathy, again, from the same article of uh, New England Journal of Medicine, are um, presented here. So. Uh, if po in polyneuropathy, there will be normal or minimal reduced nerve conduction velocity, reduced CMAP amplitude, and reduced compound snap amplitude. And critical illness myopathy, normal to minimal reduced nerve conduction velocity, reduced CMAP amplitude, reduced muscle excitability on direct stimulation, and increased CMAP duration on normal snap. So these are uh, some of the electrophysiological features of iso acquired weakness. Treatment, really nothing. Uh, Physiotherapy, passive stretching of muscles, again, protein intake to reduce sarcopenia, monitoring of uh, certain muscle groups like the vastus muscles, etc., by ultrasound to look at the, uh, the girth of the muscle or the size of the muscle, etc., have been studied, have been published, but how far they are practical or useful, uh, we really don't know. Uh, obviously, there's a huge amount of data and there's a huge amount of work being done on post-ICU care and rehabilitation. In countries like Canada and UK, there are post-intensive care unit OPDs and post-intensive care unit services which are there to go to the uh, patient's home. Uh, nurses will go to their home and do the rehabilitation and uh, for the 
uh, neuromuscular weakness and many other problems. It's just not the neuromuscular problems, but many other problems. So this is the only area which is the most promising and it's a, a very big uncharted, uh, reach, uh, you know, uncharted zone. Uh, but other than that, there is really no uh, acute treatment for isoacquired weakness as far as I know. Uh, if Dr. Bhatia wants to make a quick comment here, uh, then uh, we can. Otherwise, I think we have almost come to the end of our talk and I'll just have a few, uh, one or two slides left. Yes. That's a good point, uh, Dr. Chandra. I think uh, uh, general supportive care and removal of the offending agents remains the mainstay, as we've already pointed out. Uh, radically, and uh, we, you know, when 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 these kind of uh, damages happen to patients in the ICU, you really do not know. With the widening of the field of immunology in general and a lot of immune cascade activation in patients with sepsis and other things, and they've been, you know, treated aggressively during the course for some illness. Uh, it is a paradoxical that you know we have used, we use steroids and still steroids are one of the offending agents thought to increase the risk of developing a critical illness neuropathy. So that is slightly awkward as far as an immune pathogenesis is concerned, but I think it probably still may be existing. Based on that, uh, sporadically, we, uh, when we see sicker patients or patients with more severe uh, critical illness neuropathy where other possibilities have kind of been excluded by the whole scenario and the situation, we have uh, offered IVIT with a, with a, of course, not with a very strong evidence. There was a small trial which was conducted some years ago where they used an IgM enriched intravenous immunoglobulin therapy and compared it against albumin as a comparator, and they did not find any difference between the two groups. So, unfortunately, we don't have big trials or big, uh, you know, case studies uh, of use of IVIG in such situation, but on a frank note, I'm accepting that sometimes, uh, you know, even though it is not evidence-based, we have discussed that with the, as a team, with the, with the treating teams from which we get consultations, and we do discuss it with the families as well, and have offered IVIG as a measure. We, of course, do not know whether they improve because of that, or they anyway improve slowly as a part of the natural course of treatment, unless they have a concomitant uh, you know, GBS, which has uh, been there rather than a critical illness neuropathy. So uh, I fully agree that we do have a bit of a void as far as specificity of treatment is concerned. Uh, and uh, whether offering IPIG is a right measure, even though it is not evidence-based, is some, of course, a matter of debate. The second thing is about uh, control of hyperglycemia. Now, there has been this controversy of of uh, aggressive glucose control in ICUs in general and trials have, and then the newer age trials did show that being too aggressive is going to be worse for people with uh, with ICU uh, setting. So generally we, a wide range of glycemic status is taken care of. But there has been uh, some studies to show or a couple of studies where, uh, you know, 80 to 140 versus more wider 140 to 200 patients who were treated more aggressively with this kind of uh, glycemic status with insulin had a lesser risk of developing critical illness neuropathy. So I do not know whether that is something which uh, we all practice in routine. I think we keep them in a more moderate range because the extremes are not very, uh, I mean, extremes are not something we are comfortable with. But I can have uh, points from both of you managing uh, ICUs in critical setting much more than I do uh, in, 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 a, in a, and so what is your take on the glycemic issues in these kind of patients? Would the, current, yeah. or not? the current recommendation for uh, glycemic control in ICU as you rightly mentioned is to keep the blood sugar between 140 to 180. There was a large trial published in NEJM called the NICE sugar trial yeah. which has clearly shown that uh, if you target something between 110 to 140, which is the tight glycemic control, the incidence of hypoglycemia is much more and that has re resulted in uh, mortality difference as well. So that's why uh, 140 to 180 is now the new target for intensive care. And um, that is something which we should uh, try to achieve. And probably that will also help to reduce the incidence of uh, 
uh, ISO acquired weakness to some extent and many other problems of the ISO. Right? Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, so actually uh, the, the pathophysiology in terms of uh, at least for sepsis is uh, thought to be due to cytokines. You know, cytokines are supposed to uh, damage the uh, vessel walls of, and then that leads to edema, endoneural edema and uh, that leads to decreased uh, nutrient and oxygen supply to the uh, axons. So that is actually the pathogenesis, uh, it is in sepsis and is extrapolated to the other conditions also that it's cytokine mediated. So uh, actually th there's no therapy like you said and uh, I think IVIG, uh, your uh, enriched uh, IgM so we probably not work because of uh, that reason because it has not worked in sepsis also even in sepsis as such uh, there have been trials for IVIG but uh, they have not worked so that is uh, actually at the pathophysiology level and I would also like to just uh, tell our audience about the uh, uh, have you, you just please finish uh, Dr. Chandrasheesh because I don't want to overlap you might be talking about yeah. carry on sir yeah, yeah. so uh, that is basically it and then um, there are some other causes of muscle weakness in the ICU which should be kept in mind and uh, some of them I've already mentioned. Uh, these are the lists. So rhabdomyolysis, electrolytes like potassium, phosphate, snake venom, uh, botulism, tick bite is not very common. But tetanus, yes, obviously we do see tetanus uh, sometimes, especially the infectious disease hospitals. Uh, we also do see a poisoning like organophosphorus poisoning. Brainstem lesions and uh, paramedian cortical lesions, etc., can also cause uh, muscle weakness in all four limbs, theoretically, and uh, should be uh, definitely something that should be at the back of our mind. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Tapesh told me to uh, talk about, to discuss a few MCQs. So, with that, I think we will, uh, discussion of those MCQs, I'll finish my portion of the talk and then the discussion can always continue. So one question, first question is a young boy who comes to the ICU after a surgery for poor breathing efforts. Uh, the, the boy could not be extubated. He is otherwise conscious, uh, trying to follow commands. Uh, there was a train of four response that was seen after coming to the ICU and that was normal. Uh, which is the most unlikely source of the problem uh, in this boy? Is it a neuromuscular junction pathology which is... Uh, unlikely or a motor nerve problem which is unlikely or a spinal cord problem which is unlikely or is it electrolytes which is unlikely so which is the most unlikely cause source of the problem so because um, we don't have a voting system here so i'll just go ahead with the uh, discussion of the uh, answer so because uh, this patient is conscious uh, following command so it's very unlikely that there is some uh, anesthetic drug or something that is affecting the brain uh, currently. So the first thing that comes to our mind is, is it the neuromuscular blockers uh, or some pathology of the neuromuscular junction which is causing the problem. But if you have a normal train of four response, that basically says that your neuromuscular junction is not a problem. We don't know whether there is um, a muscle which is at fault, a myopathy which is causing it, some motor nerve disease which is causing it, electrolyte imbalance, all that is still possible. But definitely the neuromuscular junction pathology is the most unlikely because you have a normal TOF response in this child and the neuromuscular blockers or diseases like myasthenia is definitely not something which should be under consideration. So that is my first question. My second question is, which is not an usual offender in myasthenia uh, to cause myasthenic crisis? Uh, we have discussed this and if uh, those who have listened, I think it will be very easy to answer. Is it A, macrolide antibiotics? Is it B, intravenous magnesium sulfate? Is it C, clindamycin, which is another antibiotic? Or is it D, alpha blockers? Now, I already mentioned that certain antibiotics are can worsen the uh, neuromuscular weakness of which macrolides, aminoglycosides, clindamycin, uh, polymyxines are definite offenders. Uh, intravenous electrolytes among them, magnesium sulfate is a uh, concentrated electrolyte which can cause uh, weakness in myasthenics. Uh, among the uh, sympathetic receptor blockers, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are offenders but 
alpha blockers are not usual offenders in myasthenia. So the answer is D, alpha blockers in this case. Uh, we got some response also. Uh, D was the response from the audience. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I cannot see the uh, right. listing on my screen. So my third question, 55 year old obese alcoholic was found unconscious at home. Uh, somebody opened the door and found he was lying uh, on, uh, on his face on the floor. Uh, he was brought to the emergency, found to be in respiratory failure, severely acidotic, lactates high, and he was ventilated in the ICU. There is severe weakness of all four limbs uh, after the patient was ventilated for 24 hours, uh, which may be an unlikely cause for the weakness. A, is it alcoholic myopathy, which is causing the weakness? Is it B, electrolyte imbalance, which is causing the weakness? Is it C, rhabdomyolysis? Or is it D, critical illness neuromyopathy? So again, um, going on to discuss the answer. Uh, obesity, alcoholism, found unconscious. We don't know for how long he was lying there. The two major problems in these patients that we see is um, alcohol-induced myopathy and severe abdomyolysis. Because of the weight of your own body, there is muscle necrosis as well as you get dehydrated because of continuous intake of alcohol and uh, causing rhabdomyolysis. So alcoholic myopathy and rhabdomyolysis are definitely possible causes. So they will not be the answer because they are, uh, I've asked about unlikely causes. Electrolyte imbalance can happen and we don't know what is electrolyte imbalance. But a patient who is ventilated for just 24 or 48 hours will not be diagnosed as a critical illness neuromyopathy because critical illness neuromyopathy needs stay in the critical care unit and mechanical ventilation for some significant duration of time. So for 24 hours ventilation, you cannot diagnose them as a critical illness neuromyopathy. So the answer is D here. And the last question, uh, the patient with organophosphorus poisoning suffers from severe neuromuscular weakness and gets ventilated after a few days of stopping his uh, uh, atropic infusion. So, which is the most likely cause of the weakness? Is it A, GB syndrome? Is it B, ISU acquired weakness? Is it C, intermediate syndrome? Or is it D, delayed organophosphorus induced polyneuropathy? So, uh, they have said intermediate syndrome. Yes, absolutely correct. So, it is intermediate syndrome. This patient uh, was in the ICU receiving some atropine, maybe some PAM, got better, atropine stopped, shifted to ward, and now has come back with sudden severe neuromuscular weakness. All four limbs, usually they have very bad neck holding, they get ventilated, and the treatment is just that, ventilation. And you, you, you get better on your own, so there's no other treatment for this. And that is intermediate syndrome. The delayed OP-induced polyneuropathy happens much later, also sometimes called the type 3 uh, respiratory failure in these patients. Uh, ICU acquired weakness is definitely not the answer because the patient came to the ICU with neuromuscular weakness and did not develop while in ICU. And GBS is also unlikely sit giving this uh, settings. So I think with that, I would like to thank everybody. We have almost come to the end of it, uh, two hour session. It's a very long, uh, I don't know those who are still with us. Uh, thank you very much for staying with me and tolerating me for this long. Um, and uh, if there are any concluding remarks or questions, uh, we can take. Uh, otherwise, again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, Dr. Tapish. And thanks all the audience and particularly Dr. Bhatia for uh, staying with us for so long and tolerating me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sandrashish. You must be a tired man. Two hours of continuous uh, speaking and, you know, it's, it's quite tiring. I myself, you know, get tired after one hour. Thank you very much. And that was a lovely presentation, sir. Dr. Bhatia, sir, uh, any final comments from your side? I think uh, uh, Dr. Chandra has pretty much covered everything right from the, the background to individual disorders. So I don't think we have much to add. He is very well elucidated almost all the points and you brought out the discussions uh, you know, appropriately. So nothing much to add for much. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for being with us. So I just, before concluding, uh, talk a little, just uh, a few things about the respiratory part in these neuromuscular diseases. Uh, 
for just like we take uh, GBS as an example, it is important to realize uh, that what is happening in these neuromuscular uh, diseases in terms of the respiratory system because that is where the primary problem lies. So as the patient develops neuromuscular weakness, you know, his tidal volume starts falling. And as the tidal volume starts <coughs> falling, obviously the RR starts going up. And uh, there's a development of atelectasis because he starts breathing at low uh, lung volumes. So he gets initially hypoxia and <coughs> for some time there's going to be hypoxia. At the same time, because of your cranial nerve, lower cranial nerve involvement, uh, there is collapse of the upper airways, the pharyngeal and the laryngeal muscles, the loose tone, and there's a collapse. And at the same time, there is a swallowing problem that you cannot clear your mucus. Then your uh, because of the mucociliary action being impeded, and also uh, the cough reflex starts getting uh, weakened because for a good cough, you have to have a good tidal volume. So these factors together, and then your laryngeal opening does not close completely because of laryngeal muscle involvement. So there is micro aspiration going on, and there is mucus plug going on, mucus plugging going on. So all these factors together are responsible for your uh, hypoxia and your respiratory failure. And initially, like I just said, there is type one failure in these patients of neuromuscular failure, unless there is a sudden arrest, you know, developing over a period of minutes. And after your hypoxemic respiratory failure, as your tidal volume in your minute ventilation starts falling further and your dead space goes on increasing, you get hypercapnia, right? So first you get hypoxemic respiratory failure with further progression, you get type two, uh, respiratory failure. So just a few words about the uh, respiratory failure in these uh, patients of neuromuscular diseases. That's all I just wanted to add. And uh, I think uh, there are no more questions here. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Bhatia sir, uh, with your permission, and uh, Dr. Chandrashi sir, uh, we shall close now. So I think that is all. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia sir, and especially Dr. Chandrashi sir for sparing and making this presentation. And Thank the audience you. for listening to us. Thank you, and I thank Sipla for providing technical support for this presentation. And a small apology for getting interrupted in between. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Thank you, Dr. Tapesh.